Hello everyone, I'm Colin Kinnett. Today I put together a group of tips and tricks for woodworking and I've already saved time by using some of them so uh, let's have a look at them. Here's a tip I just learned and it's something that I'm going to be able to use a lot. Now when I'm making tabletops for example I often want to take away this sharp edge here and put some kind of a radius on there and I usually have an idea how wide or narrow I want that radius depending on the tabletop. And what I do when I know that radius or that diameter usually what I do is I'll run around the shop and try and find something that's about the same size usually the bottom of a can or something and then I can line it up on there and draw an arc around it and you know that works okay but it's a bit tedious but look here's another tip that works so well I can't believe it um, in this case we use a square and we align equal sides so I, and there I'm at four inches and there I'm at four inches but look at I've got four sides to do so what I decided why not just mark it with a piece of tape and then I can mark both sides top and bottom and now they're all going to be equal and all I need to do is whatever it is I can put a mark in there I could put masking tape there and mark on the masking tape but now I know the pivot point for a compass so you could put whatever kind of a compass you have on there I have one of these that I showed you in a video not long ago um, put that down like that and I've already pre-marked that and just draw the arc like that and now I can take that to all four sides and they're all equal all really easy to find so there's a quick way of finding a radius for easing rounds now this next sequence there's actually going to be a few tips that are going to go into this because it's all a little bit related now the first part is I want to show you how to to drill a hole into a dowel and there's all sorts of reasons why people need to do that sometimes they're inserting another dowel sometimes it's metal there's all sorts of things that go on there and how do you hold that well the easiest way is to just literally drill a hole if you've got a drill press just drill a hole that the dowel will fit into but before you put the dowel in go to your bandsaw and just cut a wide slot in there because that wide slot will be able to basically making a clamp here and when you put your dowel into it you'll be able to it'll bottom out at the very bottom so you know that it's going to be nice and firm in there and the next thing you can do is use some kind of a clamp and I'm just using it uh, just a little C clamp here and I'll put it on the side so that you'll be able to see that when I put some pressure on there you'll be able to see how that sort of clamps that wood there and it's really strong in there you there's no way you could turn that you would need a pair of pliers to turn that so drilling another hole in that's going to be easy And you can see just how easy that is. There's you know, nothing fancy there. Now, the second part of this ha is, has to do with an, another dowel. And sometimes you'll get very small dowels like this. And this tip is from Todd. And he was drilling into some material and having difficulty with the drill bit that he was using. It kept splitting the wood. So what he found was if he used a very tiny drill bit and put it in reverse and that's a great tip because when you put a drill bit in reverse it still cuts but it doesn't it's not as aggressive and especially in wood like this it would work fine. So he put it in reverse and he had to keep making he was actually making a little tiny wooden washer and the next then he moved up to another size uh, until he got to the size that he needed and he kept putting drill bits in but putting them in reverse and he actually got to make that washer exactly what he wanted and the dowel didn't split which is what can happen because drill bits are, are typically aggressive and if they catch the wood especially if it's tiny wood like this you can split that even if the drill bit doesn't wander it can still split the wood so that was a really good tip but it also reminded me um, you know here's another uh, example of sort of reverse woodworking or backward woodworking like I, I, I talked about in a video um, a few weeks ago 
Um, the other thing that you want to be able to reverse is if you ever have something like this where you're cutting. Sorry, I just wanted to get a closer look so you can see what I'm talking about here. So this bit is for drilling countersink holes. And if you have screws like this, see the underside of that screw, that has you need to drill in almost all cases you need to drill a countersink hole for that otherwise it can split the wood so what we do we use a bit like this and these typically these bits are designed for metalworking but we use them in woodworking because they work but when you're drilling with one of these typically the thing that we do is we drill the same way we're drilling a hole or drilling um, driving a screw in so that's typically in that direction and of course we spin it fairly quickly which I'm not doing right now the problem is these bits will always make a very ragged um, hole sort of a um, diamond shaped hole in there the, the sides are very rough and here's another example of reverse woodworking what we do is we reverse the bit and go against the grain. Now here's 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 it. That's where it will typically be digging in. This is what we do, and we reverse that bit, and it actually makes a very nice smooth hole. Now you can drill it in. You know, drill hard, pull it, putting the bit in, and then once you get in, reverse it, and it gives a very nice smooth. Um, recess for countersink holes. So another example of more reverse woodworking. This next tip was sent to me by Eric and Eric says that when he's making some measurements sometimes you're in a difficult position it's hard to see and what he does is he puts a little piece of tape on his tape measure and that way he can mark wherever that mark is that he wants he can translate that mark later on but that way he doesn't mark up his tape measure and I thought you know that's a really good idea I've never thought about doing that what I have done on certain occasions is I will put masking tape on the outside of my tape and mark uh, you know whatever measurements that I need now, I know some of you who are new to the channel are saying, Colin, why don't you spend a buck and get yourself a decent tape? I've, looks like this one's wrapped up with yellow tape. Well, yes, it is, but there's a reason for that, and that's because that tape is not broken. This tape is marked yellow because this lives on my workbench. I also have a blue tape, exactly the same brand, same everything. The blue one lives at my miter gauge, and I have a red version, and that lives at my table saw. And if you're new to my channel, you will know, you won't know rather, that all of the tapes that I use, in this case, they're called left hand tapes because when I hold them in my left hand, I'm right handed. And the first thing I do is pick up a pencil in my right hand and I pick up the tape in my left hand. But if you have a look at your tape that you're using, I'll bet you money that they are right hand tapes. And that means that when you pick up a pencil in your right hand and you pick up the tape, all of the numbers are upside down. Now, for some people, that doesn't matter. They can adjust for upside down numbers. But over the years, I've discovered that for some reason, I get mixed up when numbers are upside down and I make cutting mistakes from time to time. For example, if I was going to make a, a cut at eight and a half inches, often I would think about eight and a half. I think it's because we read left to right, but I would make a mark there, for example, unless I was really paying attention, which of course is not eight and a half inches. It's actually seven and a half inches. So I, when I discovered left-hand tapes, I instantly stopped making cutting mistakes. I Now I never measure twice and cut once. I measure once and I cut once and I almost never ever make mistakes because now all of the numbers are the right way up and I can read them and I just don't make mistakes anymore. I actually did a video on this some time ago uh, and I'll put a link to that at the end of the video and you'll be able to go see more on measuring tools in the workshop. I use a variety of these little thumb bolts in 
all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's part of my camera gear. Often they're in a variety of different jigs. And I always seem to never have, if you look at all three of these, all three have different threads. And sometimes they just never work for what I'm working with. Um, and I might have a bolt, but I don't have a mechanism to sort of hold on to it. So today I'm going to show you a trick that um, Michael sent me on how you can make a quick thumb bolt. So for today, I'm going to use this bolt and this, what you're seeing here, you can take this off, but I'm going to be using hot melt glue to make a top for it. The other thing you're going to need is some sort of a wrench. This is a metric wrench um, and we're going to be using the box end. So I've just taken and put some masking tape on. In my case I used yellow just because it's a little stickier and I've got that in that orientation. You can see that wrench in that and I'm just going to put that at an angle in my vise so that it's going to sit like that so that when I pour hot glue in there it's going to settle um, according to the gravity is going to sort of pull it flat. So there you can see how the wrench is sitting at a little bit of an angle and I've done a little bit of experimenting with this and this seems to be the way that works best, at least for me. And now I'm just sticking that bolt in there like that. And now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour hot melt glue in there and you have to wait quite a while for that to dry and harden. Okay, now I'm just going to fill that void there with hot melt glue. Just kind of fill that up. That's good. Okay, I've let this sit for I think probably about 10 minutes and you can tell that it's ready because it's kind of gone opaque and it's pretty firm in there. Uh, at this point you can pull the tape off, it doesn't really matter. And now you can see sort of what you've got. Now you might be able to push that out but what I found in my experimenting is the best way to get this out is to just put this in your your vise that you're already working with and just sort of wiggle that around a little bit and it will pull right out of there. There it is. And it really doesn't leave, I found it really doesn't leave a residue in there. I also tried a variety of things for release. I tried some paraffin wax that didn't really work. I tried WD-40 that didn't really work and it does it seems like you don't really need anything. Now this is a pretty new wrench and it slides out pretty easy in there but you'll have to see what yours looks like but there you go there's a at least a rudimentary a nut that I could use now on a jig or on some of my camera gear uh, until I get the proper one well that concludes my video for today and as I said earlier on I'll put a link to a video that I did quite some time ago on measuring tips and tricks. That's been a very popular video. In fact, when I meet people, they often talk about what they've learned in that video. So that'll pop up right there. You'll be able to go and have a look at that. And maybe you'll get some ideas for some more tips and tricks that you can use in your own workshop. I'm Colin Kinnett for Woodwork Web. Thanks for watching.